so Gonzo, good morning. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Good. How are you? Um, doing well, adjusting to a new reality like pretty much everybody else in the world. Yeah. Um, we certainly appreciate you taking time to join the podcast today, given everything happening. Yes, I'm excited. Um, so going to dive in um, and, you know, ask you more about who you are for the listening and viewing audience that doesn't know Sill, doesn't know Our Bridge and that sort of stuff. But we'd like to start uh, off hopefully with a few fun questions. And if we Google you enough, uh, it appears you have a favorite drink. Can you tell the people a little bit about that? That's right. So it's um, my favorite drink. It's mate. It's M-A-T-E. Uh -huh. um, it's an Argentinian traditional drink, and I'm drinking it right now. It's a um, it's a funny looking cup. Yeah. Um, and can I? Do we have time for me to show you? Yeah, please. Go no? ahead. Right. Okay, do so your time. Do whatever you want. <laughs> so the way you drink it, um, it's um, the way I drink it. Really, on my side of of how I grew up, it's basically like dried leaves. Okay. And you have a bombisha. This is right here. I don't know if you can see, but it has like um, a little spoon. Uh, oh, like a filter. Like yeah. a filter. So you put the bombisha in, you put the sherba in. I um, I drink it sweet, so I put sugar, and then you put hot water, mm. and you just drink through the bombisha, and you just take the tea. You don't drink any of the leaves. Wow. And this is um, it's our companion. We drink it all the time, like in the morning while we're having lunch, while we're having meetings. Um, at the center, people drink it with me, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, there's every time that you go to a friend's house and you say hello, as soon as they open the door, they're preparing the water to start drinking wow. mate. And uh, we go to the parks and drink it, at the beach, everywhere, all the time. And the thing that um, I find a lot of Americans like with a huge question mark, it's because we pass it around. Ah. And I know that's a big no no right now. No, yeah, but... <laughs> right now. Yeah, no <laughs> it's not pandemic approved. Right. But, um, <laughs> You, uh, you drink it and then, um, so one person is in charge of making it. So if I'm the one who makes it, then um, I make it and then I pass it to you. You drink it, you pass it back to me. I make it again and I then pass it to whoever to, um, oh, tell me your name again, sorry. Kelsey. Kelsey, I'll just pass it to Kelsey and um, uh, she'll give it back to me and then I drink it and then we start over. Why can't each person get their own cup? Oh, because obviously really American. No, <laughs> that's not that's not the tradition. Okay. Now we are, <laughs> but the idea is to pass it around. It's it's um it's uh mm. yeah, it's cool. so ingrained into us. You know, I mean, my, Martina drunk my daughter. I have a video of her drinking mate before you yeah. know she walk, walk or talk. So wow. And yeah, so have you ever try this is spelled M A T I Mati the um, do you know what I'm talking about? Did you ever try it? The it was like in a can and it was based off this the same mate? drink. Yeah, that yellow can. Um, yeah, I think they had different versions, but it was based out of Durham, um, and they tried to kind of like enter the like healthy energy drink market. No, it's like the um. new ale. It's like <laughs> no, I tried it. It's not the same. You can drink tell, it. Tell the people how you feel, so Tell the people how you feel. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm in a point of just honesty. <laughs> Bring it. No filter, because it's crazy. And I think that if, if the world is gonna end tomorrow, because you know, just say it. No, um, I tried it, um, and it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I I'm not a fan. Um, but yeah. I think uh, they gone. they went out of business. So anything. Yeah, but there are there are them. there are people now. I mean, you can go to the stores and you can go to Harris Theater and buy the can of of mate in a can. Mm. Um, it's like a soda, and I I've seen a lot of people drinking it. I mean, because mate is very good for you too. It has some um, antioxidants and it's a, a much much healthier uh, version of caffeine. Yep. It's called mate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and some people like it. It's just not, it's just not my thing because it's, 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 I'm old school. That's it. Yeah. Do they serve it anywhere in Charlotte? Um, no, you have to buy it by the can, like in the, those like Whole Foods. So no or restaurants or anywhere else kind of no, make it. Restaurants. You can go to like the, the Harris Theater and, and Publix mm -hmm. have it. Yeah. I don't know if any other stores have it. 
Well, this is good because I feel like a few years ago we talked about you guys opening a food truck with like cultural foods and this needs to be on the food truck menu served by kids and whipped up by kids and that sort of stuff. Oh, I forgot about that. That would be so cool. We're back. We're back we're at back. it. Actually, we're having a food truck every day now at the, at the, um, at the apartment complex. It's not a food truck, a van with food. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I forgot about that. That's, oh, that's a great idea. Still. Okay. Well, so we'll, you make it yourself at home, but can we get it anywhere in Charlotte? El mate? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Sherba, you can buy at the Compare Foods. I don't know if you're familiar with, mm -hmm. with these words. So, Compare Food has um, a decent variety of Sherba. And then Sherba can come with like mint, with um, orange peel, um, honey. And yeah, you can buy it there. And well, this thing, you have to buy it um, online. I, I haven't found anywhere here. Hmm. Um, or, my brother can bring you one, or I can. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So the second thing we found after googling Silk Anzo was that you like to try new things. So I guess the follow-up question there is like, what's the best new thing you've tried? Does it have to be like um, experience or anything? It's your world, so it's your world. Oh, something that rocked my world was um, this is stupid. Um, Brussels sprouts. Keep going. <laughs> Tell us just, more. just Brussels sprouts. Just like seeing them or what? <laughs> like, <laughs> the way they grow? Because that's pretty crazy. No, I mean, I mean, like, I've never, ever thought that I would like Brussels sprouts because I've never tried them. And uh, I saw them there and they were kind of fancy looking. And I'm just now, nah. um, but I went through. Was this like a store or a restaurant? Like, walk us through this experience. Like the, like, the, like the store and you know, you hear it like it exists, but you're like, that's, that's way beyond anything I will ever try. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of a picky, picky eater too. So um, I, I never thought I, I liked it, but I went to a, to a Christmas party, a holiday party this past December and I had to, like there were four of us on the table and this woman was so proud of her Brussels sprouts. I was like, oh, I had to eat this. Um, and you know you have to but it just oh. changed my world now i i well, it's, it sounds so silly but um i love them i know how to make them like 17 different ways now and i'm there just you go. The best it's delicious so that's the last new thing i tried that i'm very very proud of can't believe a woman that's been to the white house and running the program that you're running was intimidated by little old brussels sprouts i think of them as like tiny cabbages they are they're weird and how do they grow <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make, Bruce's press don't make sense. So, um, no, I loved it. And that's, I, when I read your question, that's the first thing that came to my mind. Like that's how, true. how, and, and you know, I use it now with my kids because it's like, they don't want to try anything new. And I'm like, listen, when you're my age, someday you come around this and you'll remember me. There you go. That's right. Yeah. That's great. Good. Yeah. All right. Our third entry question. Okay. Uh, congrats on five years. Cause Thank you. I think you're celebrating five years right now. Um, and it's a weird time to be celebrating five years. So you kind of had to adapt to current situation with a virtual fundraiser. Yeah. How'd that go? So, um, in five years for our bridge, not your birthday, or I mean, it might be your birthday. <laughs> no, it's not my, my birthday. <laughs> uh, so it's, um, so, oh gosh, it's been, it's like the universe doesn't want us to have a big celebration. So the five, five years um, was going to be um, was going to be an event last October, um, but we had some challenges last summer uh, with staff, and we had to. Um, long story short, so I, I we've never had a development person, and we realized that with a budget that is almost a million dollars, we have to have somebody help out um, with not just grant writing, but the networking part, which is what I'm still working on. Um, I don't know if you got this, Greg, but I'm kind of an introvert person. So going to parties and getting to know people and passing cards, I mean, that's still not my thing. Huh. Although I love it. Um, yeah. I love the one-on-one. They're so good at it when you do it. No, but you know, I, I suffer through it though. I mean, yeah. I can go with somebody and have coffee and talk for hours, or yeah. um, if I'm like in, in our environment at the center, um, at, a, at an event, um, like in-house, I'm, I'm, I kill it. But sure. if you throw me into a, a party with people I don't know, mm. I shut down. Mm. Okay. Um, so I realized I needed some help with that. Um, so 
And I mean, I, I've been teaching myself how to do this ED role and how that means. Because yeah. I mean, I didn't apply for this job. I kind of landed on it. Right. So it has been like a learning experience, like every single day, every hour, every challenge, every new question. It was always like a, a gut feeling, um, um, find some research behind it and make a decision. <laughs> um, so I, the board um, approved um, the budget to hire somebody to help me out and I hired the wrong person mm. and it was devastating, like devastating. Um, you mind sharing was, more about like that process? Cause I feel like with the leaders we've had on the podcast and others listening, it's like a, uh, just like a really intimate decision, right? To hire somebody then t the time consuming and the interaction. So can you share what you're comfortable sharing about what made that challenging? Yeah, so basically everything, you know, I mean, um, our bridge is, it's sort of my baby and we have, and I have very um, specific um, perspectives on how yep. fundraising should be done yep. that don't really fall into what traditional people who does fundraising do. For example, I mean, <clears throat> um, <coughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Um, one of the one of the things that I fought with people who tried to help and, and I get it. I mean, it's, 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 it's what they know. I mean, just putting a picture of a child in a letter asking for money. Mm -hmm. That to me is a huge no, no, mm -hmm. you know, um, if you talk for, because it's, um, I don't know. It's just, oh, why, why? Oh, great. No, no, I was curious, right? Because <laughs> I think I a lot of people's default, why. Right? It, it's important to understand, right? It's important for people to understand that perspective and like, get it. Yeah. So, and this is a very personal thing. Um, sure. To me, children are, it's not their fault that we, I mean, it's, they, they should not, children and the program and the kids and their humanity and what they are, what they've been through, what they've been through, like their, their experiences, it's all that is so private yep. to me and respecting that humanity and that individuality and them it has to be separate from the business. Sure. Yep. You no, know, I mean, we obviously, we have to tell what we do. We have to share um, some of the success stories of the kids. We have, but I mean, um, am I going to ask a child to give me permission to put their face in there? I mean, I think, I think the child needs to agree and their parents need to agree. Family. Yeah, sure. And we do have permission from parents to post pictures and share and take pictures of the kids, but I feel like using, it's using them. Yep. And I feel terrible about it, but you know, I've been, it's, there has been so much pushback with, well, but that's what, that's what, you know, the, the heartstrings and, and I just refused. Um, the other thing is, you know, telling the kids stories and what they've been through before and that idea of just, I don't know, like fostering pity or mm -hmm. asking people to feel sorry for our kids. I mean, mm -hmm. why? You know, I mean, they've been through what they've been through and we know because our program and our staff and, and our relationships are, ba are based in trust with the families. Um, and I, we have no right to no. use their experiences to make money. Right. No, I, I appreciate you sharing. I think it's important all the time, but <clears throat> excuse me, also now given the current situation in COVID and I think We've seen an influx of emails and just uh, social media posts kind of maybe trending towards that line as well. And, you know, using this um, maybe too opportunistic in a way. And it's a balance, right? Because we know there's a lot of communities that are affected by this and there's a lot of good programs working to serve those communities. Um, but I think it uh, comes down to intent and a very thin line between making sure the intent's in the right place. 100%. Um, so that's, that's what... Um... That, that was was challenging. So when um when I was giving the the green light to hire somebody who knows like fundraising and and the science behind it, which mm -hmm. I still try to figure it out. Um, I hired somebody who I thought it was the best for the role, and and I guess I didn't know what the role what it was and I couldn't supervise him as well as I thought I could. Um, 
you know, I mean, at the center with the staff, I mean, it's much easier because I've done all of the roles. Like right. I, I've been a driver, yeah. I've been the admin, I've been the program director, I've been doing the curriculum, I've the been editor, the my, cafeteria the worker, right? I've been doing HR, <laughs> I've been doing everything indoors yeah. with the kids in the program. So, I mean, no problem in that. It's very much, um, um, I have no issue with it. Yep. But with this new role and a whole new thing, I mean, I thought I, I was able to manage it and. I basically wasted four months of salary mm. on somebody who was doing nothing. Mm. Um, so we were, we were, um, and this guy, I mean, he, I shouldn't, I, I mean, it's just, I, I had like 75% of the, of the blame, but he had other issues that he didn't tell me about when we were um, interviewing and, and through that process that they came, it came out in the middle of it. Um, mm. So I had to let him go. So what advice would you give to other leaders, like particularly around hiring? <clears throat> Take your time, mm. you know, and, and, um, and I think somebody told me this and I'm a little stubborn and I didn't listen. Um, you know, take your time. And um, I wanted to make it happen in that summer last year because the event was supposed to happen on October 24th, which is um, United Nations Day. And I kind of, I, 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 I was in a hurry. Um, I didn't take the time to put like goals. I didn't, I didn't take the time to try this person. You know, I think that giving a person a month to raise a certain amount of money based only in networking, you know, that's something that I think, I mean, I should have done and I didn't. Um, yeah, so we have to postpone that event um, and I realized that I really didn't want to hire anyone else ever again. Like I was so traumatized. <laughs> it's hard because then, you, I mean, you have to own it too, right? Because it was like your decision, your process. So part of it's like you as a leader have to shoulder that. It was terrible. It was terrible. And I hate losing and I hate to, to say that I'm wrong. Um, but I, it, now, I mean, I see it and it was, it was 100% of me. Right. Um, but then no. you learn and adjust. What? Then you learn and adjust and the next one will be better. Oh yeah, yeah. So what we are, um, I, what I did after um, we postponed the event, well, we canceled the event. Yeah. And we, I started meeting with um, other nonprofits and see how each nonprofit does their development. Oh, and I nice. saw organizations that are, have our budget and they have like four full-time people doing development. Yeah. And that blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Like four people, like one for big grants, the other one for grant writing, the other one for networking, the other one for signing off, the other one, I mean, it's just like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How? Um, so that's, uh, that was way beyond us. Um, then somebody else was like, a, had a part-time job from yeah. home and that worked for them. And I don't, I don't, I don't think I can manage somebody like that. So no. Um, but then I met with um, Cindy, what's her name? Cindy Patterson at the Lean Institute. Yep. And what they do is they hire or they partner with the Lee Institute. And the Lee Institute is a contracted person, a contracted, yeah. yeah, like a partner, you know, I mean, they don't work for um, Cindy, but they do all the development behind the scenes. And what they did um, for Cindy was, okay, Cindy, today we're in July. These are the events that are coming up. These are the ones that you should go. These mm -hmm. are the ones that you should send somebody. Mm -hmm. These are the uh, people that you need to reach out. These are the grants that you need to sign. And, you know, and Cindy just shows up mm -hmm. and signs. And that's what it's told. And I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to manage anything. Yeah. I mean, um, what I think shows adaptive leadership, right? You have to do that in order to figure out what works for you and the organization, right? Well, yeah. I mean, because I... I I realize, I mean, I don't know enough of this role yet to be able to, to manage it successfully. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we partner with Lee and I'm, I'm working with um, Pat Martin and Andy. I, I can't remember his name, it's Andy. Um, so they've been amazing. You know, I mean, they are taking over all the grant writing. Um, and if I shout out or text an idea, they're on it. Great. Um, they uh, put together the event. It was going to be an amazing event. Um, they uh, did the auction and it's just so very easy going and there's mm -hmm. no uh, stress behind it. Um, and, you know, Pat has like 35 years of experience in grant writing, yeah. um, which is amazing. She cool. knows exactly what to say. 
and how to say it. Yep. And um, I'm learning a lot from them. So I'm, I'm, we're having a contract until the end of July. Okay. And I'm basically they're training me <clears throat> to to learn how this works. Um, yeah, I, I'm awesome. hopeful that we'll be able to keep them um, with us. Because I really, I really don't, I, I really like this dynamic. That's great. Yeah. So I think like take that and like that idea around adaptive leadership and kind of take it over to what a lot of us are facing now across the country and really the world with COVID. So like how are you as a leader adapting to this and how is it affecting the day-to-day of our bridge? Um, well, we, um, well, it's affecting, it's upside down, right? Um, yeah. Like everybody else. So when we first heard that schools were going to be closed, um, we all looked at each other and like, now what? Because we are first, um, our primary, primary source of funding is 21st century Mm -hmm. and we are at their mercy. You know what I mean? It's like, are they going to allow us to continue working? Are they going to allow us to shift to be 100% in the community? Um, and then looking at each other and our staff, like especially the part-time staff, um, that it's paid while the kids are there and for training and stuff. So um, we very quickly, once school was out and we heard from 21st century that, you know, the staff can still be paid as long as we justify our service to the community and to the families and the support. Yep. So once we heard that, I mean, it was just an emergency SOTU meeting, which is a state of the union meeting for us. Yep. Um, and just, okay, brainstorming, how do we do this? Um, and so that was Monday, the first Monday that school was out. And on Wednesday, we started with the um, lunch deliveries. We started with 40 bag lunches from CMS, mm-hmm. um, from CMS feeding sites, and we picked it up. We took it to one neighborhood to see how it worked. And that happened, uh, I mean, we are now about 2,500 lunches per week. Wow, so you guys are distributing to families? To the families um, on the east side. That's um, so that's that, and also, I mean, including Saturday and Sundays. Sure. Oh. Um, and while we're doing that, at the same time, we are um, in constant communication with families. And I think that one of the things that we had to ask ourselves is, okay, now we're gonna see exactly, you know, number one, how crucial we are for our families. Yep. Number two, if we have the level of trust that we thought we had. And um, the answer to both questions, I mean, it's exactly what we expected. You know, we are, they are calling us, we are, um, it's a around the clock support. I mean, what they need, how they're feeling. Um, some parents are more worried about food mm-hmm. than others, um, some families are, confused with this Chromebook connectivity, yeah. I'm one, you know, <laughs> how do we make it happen? Right. So, um, you know, yeah. uh, we are preparing packages in 12 different languages with um, the outreach way and how to, the outreach way is I'll take care of myself, I'll take care of others, I'll take care of the community, oh, I'll take care of my environment. Um, and how does that apply to these times? Sure. So we have created an outreach way package specifically for COVID-19 um, in 12 different languages that we are mailing wow. to families with information. Incredible. Here's wow. how you um, find, you know, health, um, um, health. Uh, yeah. If you need to go to a doctor, here's what to do. If you don't have insurance, what to do. If you're undocumented, this is what to do. Um, with food, the places are receiving food, uh, what we are doing, um, you know, court dates for the Central American families. So we, it has, it has been, I'm so proud of our team. So we are sending. I mean, you guys are really providing as many services as you can. You're not just running an after-school program anymore. You're doing no. It's not an after-school program, services, right? right? There's yeah. no there's no school, so right. there's no. Yeah. Um, but you know, the feeding is one. Um, the staff. We're gonna have a meeting um, later today about um, now that we know where our parents are with their internet access, um, their Chromebooks or their phones. Yep. Um, we're going to coordinate a uh, like a daily meeting with all the kids. Uh, by grade, not by grade, not by class, um, to have a welcome meeting and see how everybody's doing, just have the same sort of like community time that we have yep. at the center every day. So we're still gonna do that. Um, we're gonna do um, online tutoring for um, for homework, um, you know, math tournaments over Zoom, <laughs> and and yep. think, yeah. So we are we are. I mean, we are we are doing as much as we did before. It's just yep. that not at the center. 
So what do you think is going to come of all this? Like COVID hopefully goes away soon. People are back working, back healthy programs, back up and running in a regular way. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think it's going to affect your work moving forward and just like after school programs in general? Um, hold on. I think I wrote an answer yesterday to that. <laughs> you came prepared, huh? <laughs> Uh, I can find it. So um, how is it going to affect us? I think that, um, that I think it's not just for us, but I think that for schools, we all have to reinvent what the education system looks like. It has been the same for the past hundred years and obviously it's not working, yep. right? Um, because no one was ready for this. I think with the technology that we are living in right now, having to be at the school for learning is why? Yeah. Um, I think that um, at the center, I think that our relationships with the families are going to be much closer. Um, we are meeting so many more families and, and we're meeting so many other kids, uh, um, which is great. You know, I don't, looking back, I don't think we were enough in the neighborhood. And we were a lot in the neighborhood. I was going to say, if any program and leader, <laughs> like you guys are more in the neighborhoods than a lot of folks we know, to be honest. We are always there, right? Yeah. And because uh, we, we've always had this idea like after school three to six is just one little piece of what we do. But if we have a, you know, 55 tickets out of nowhere on Sunday morning to go to see a soccer team, whatever, yeah. we'll make it happen that night. I mean, it's yeah. just, um, that's the level of commitment and how, um, how involved our families and our staff is and our volunteers. And, um, and still it wasn't enough, right. you know? Um, so I think that it's, uh, there's a lot that we're all learning. I think that we're all going to come out of this better in every single way, like from cooking from home to, you know, getting more exercise to, yep. um, um, yeah, I think that the schools will have the most, um, to think about. Yeah, I think it's definitely, a, you know, a, a reset outside just the health implications, but all markets, right. But particularly education. I think if nothing else, giving a sense of urgency for how important it is to innovate and think differently, um, not only for what's happening now, but for the previous hundred years where the current system hasn't been serving kids or families as well as what they should be. Yeah, and I think it also kind of, um, we knew how, um, how inequitable. Inequitable, yeah. Yeah? Yep. We knew, we knew the difference in socioeconomical um, access to education. We knew it. Now it's just being I think it has been exposed. That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Ridiculously. And a lot of people should be ashamed of it. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, how, how come, uh, it's just how, I mean, the differences of my kids and how they're being connected with the family, except my house. Right. <laughs> it's a whole different thing with a stupid Chromebook. But, um, <laughs> They're, you know, they're, they're, um, they're friends. Well, I mean, they're you all... have a laptop, right? You have another computer that you can use. Like we have another... a laptop, we another have Wi-Fi. Um, right. yeah. You know, I mean, I, it's just, it's, it, the, a lot of families don't have access to that. Right. So why do we keep assuming that because the kids are physically at the school, they all need the same thing. Sure. And that's what I think it's, it's driving me, it's driving me crazy, you know? So uh, we're going to get to some more about that in our bridge, but let's back up a little bit. Like, tell us, you know, quickly about Sill and growing up. What was like home like and child like for you? Okay, how oh, did you come out to your hand? hand? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, um, I am from Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. um, the capital of Argentina. I grew up in a neighborhood called Banfield, like the, like the vet store. Okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was outside of Buenos Aires, like a very, very urban area. Um, I grew up with my mom, my older brother, and my younger sister. You get to go back a lot? Um, if I go back a lot now? Yeah, like, do you go back? No, no, no. I mean, we haven't gone back in a long time. It got expensive when we had kids. Sure. Um, and I mean, my husband's, most of my husband's family is here. Yeah. Um, in my family, it's just me, but back home, I just have my brother, my sister, and my mom, and they come visit me. <clears throat> so actually, my brother, it's, um, it's here because he got stranded with all this COVID. He can go back. Oh. <gasps> that so good or bad for you? 
Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, I mean, it's great. It's great. <laughs> looking, he built a fence. Put I mean, work. So- good, yeah, put him to work. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he's, um, yeah, so we, we haven't seen each other in like 13 years, and, and he oh. decided to come right before a global pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and my sister. So, um, my parents divorced when I was, I think, 11, and I didn't really see my dad until. I decided to leave because I needed his um, his permission to leave the country because I was underage. Really? And yeah, so I tracked him down and got him to sign, and that was the last time I I heard or talked to him. And is that a law in Argentina? Yeah, because I was under twenty one, so oh. I needed permission from both parents. Mm. Is that still the case? I'm not twenty one anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but in Argentina, I was wondering. I didn't know that. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even if you're 20 and you cannot leave the country. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so then, okay, so that's helpful. Then, like, fast forward, like, why Our Bridge? Why after school programs? Well, first, tell the people exactly what Our Bridge is. Yeah, so um, Our Bridge, it's um, in essence, before all this, um, we offer after school and summer programs to children who are new to the United States um, or first generation, um, mostly refugee and immigrant asylum seekers. Um, we offer after school summer that are based on um, experiential learning sure. and um, it's ESL based. So we have our own curriculum. Um, we do a lot of things to help the kids learn English or improve their English skills. The same way that we learned our first language, which is, you know, by doing, talking, interacting, visiting, processing. And um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty sweet. We have about 150 kids every day at the center um, after school, um, 200 at the year, during the year, um, if you include um, summer. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, they represent about 22 different countries, um, speak seven different languages. And it's, it's awesome. And I think it's important for, you know, the audience to understand you, maybe me, others in in Kelsey in the after school space who have been in it, but kids are outside of school in a traditional school year more than they're in school, right? So the importance of having exposure, not only to a quality school, but quality things to do after school is really important. So can you talk a little bit about that as well? Oh, yeah. So... Um, most of the refugee families, when they are resettled, they are, um, they are, they are placed in, um, an apartment. Um, they're given 90 days of support to enroll the kids in school, to, um, get their social security, to get Medicaid, to get on track with their green card. Um, but it's just 90 days to basically enter a whole new world. Is that 90 days something that North Carolina does or federally? No, that's federal level. Okay. Yeah, so Charlotte has two resettlement agencies, um, Catholic Charities and um, Carolina Refugee Resettlement Agency. And they receive individuals for resettlement. Um, so they receive um, funding for each person and that funding covers 90 days. So 90 days, I've been here 17 years. And I still get lost in downtown. So <laughs> it's, it's insane. Yep. You know, a lot of families have been um, living in refugee camps for decades. Uh, a lot of families have never seen a microwave. Uh, a lot of families don't understand how the, um, the, the buses work. Yep. Um, kids have been born and raised in refugee camps. Or if they were not refugees, I mean, they were um, in areas that were super rural um, that didn't have access to school. So the, um, the great, how do you call it? When they don't have academic background? When they've never been in school? Background checks? No, there's a, there's a term when they haven't been at school. In, uh, interrupted education? Um, I don't know. Well, so a lot of the kids have never been at school, so they don't know how to hold a pencil. Um, yeah. and, <clears throat> And so if they go past that 90 days without being technically, quote unquote, settled, they're at risk of being deported? No, um, refugees cannot be deported. Okay. So refugees and immigrants are, are different um, status. Okay. So refugees, they apply for um, refugee status in the country that they have been um, settled after. So refugees leave their country right. um, because they are, um, they have, that's my son. Hi, good morning. Good morning. 
Okay. What time is it? You can join. It's 11 11 30. 11.30 <laughs> Eastern. <laughs> so this is this is how it works. <laughs> um, real. Gee, I'm not even embarrassed. I was like, I don't know. You gonna have breakfast or lunch? Um, it's brunch time. To, um, <laughs> yeah, it's brunch. She's a brunch guy. It's a, a brunch. brunch guy. Hey, it's yeah. brunch. Good. Eggs and Brussels sprouts. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Yeah, so um, refugees, when they leave their country, uh, fleeing persecution, um, war, violence, whatever, um, they settle in a neighboring country. Right. And in that country, they can apply for refugee, for refugee status um, to the UNCHR. And then they are dispersed around the world to the countries that are resettled. So it's Australia, Canada, England, the United States. Um, when they come to the United States, um, they are sent out to cities if they did not have a request to unification with families. And that's how they end up in Charlotte sometimes. Um, and once they're here, I mean, they have been checked. I mean, there's no process more thorough than a refugee. So they've been through all sorts of background checks. He, their, um, while uh, the, the process lasts like two or three years. Wow. And then once they come here. So once they come here, they are um, lawful citizens. They get the green card and they have a path to citizenship. After five years, they can apply for the citizenship. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's that, but they, they do get 90 days of support. Right. And then they have to work and start paying their bills and pay their ticket back because it's a, they have to work to pay the ticket that brought them here. Wow. Um, yeah, so I mean, and, and the, the places that they are usually placed to work um, are factories, and in most cases, it's the second shift. Mm. And that means that they're not at home when the kids come back from school. That's right. And so I, Power Bridge is right. Cool, right? For and sure. I, saw, I saw that happening uh, back in 2010 um, when I was working with The Bridge, which is a, it was a, under a for profit company. Um, I noticed that a lot of the refugee families were not at home with the kids, were, um, you know, off school. But I also noticed, and I don't know how, how honest you want me to be, Greg, here. Please. Um, but I know, and I think you know this. I mean, I told you this a thousand times. Uh, uh, a lot of very aggressive converting groups were taking advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And they would be um, picking up the kids at the neighborhoods. That's Michelle, my dog. Hey, Michelle. Everybody Good introduction to the whole family. I like it. I know. <laughs> you see my daughter's, this is my daughter's studio. There's some Legos. Yeah, in the art. It's great. Um, I need a, I need a home of this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Um, so the, um, yeah, so these groups. Um, but you said they would like push in and kind of take a, like, calling like the neighborhoods including vulnerable kids and families, right? Well, kids were, because um, we were, we were welcoming about 70 kids. Um, but in the neighborhoods, there were hundreds more. Um, and I remember when I would go um, visit families or take the kids back home at night, I would see these um, white vans just picking up children. And sometimes they would want to come to a center and pick up children from our center. And I'm like, well, who are you? Where are you going? They say, oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, we're going to go play soccer. And if I looked inside the van, I saw, um, you know, number one, it was like a 12 passenger van. There were like 17 kids in there with babies in their laps. Mm. And it was insane. I mean, no accountability, no safety, no liability, nothing. Uh, and parents didn't know. Because right. I started like, investigating and I, and I talked to parents. Parents had no idea where the kids were after school. And the right. more I investigated these groups like and that, talking right? to the kids, the kids that were um, either Buddhist or Hindu, er, um, um, Muslim, they were talking more and more about the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the parents didn't know. Well, and I just thought that was the worst. Yeah. Um, so that's when um, the organization, the, the for-profit company that we work in, that we were working under, um, decided to close. Um, I was afraid for what would happen with the kids that we were working with, okay. and the families that were trusting us that we were going to respect their cultures and their beliefs, and um, we just took it over. You know, I mean, and um, without really knowing what we were getting into. Um, we just started a 5 one c 3 because there really wasn't another after-school program that wasn't faith-based that would welcome both immigrant and refugee kids. Yep. 
And that's I how think it's still started. true five years later, right? Yeah. You guys are still really the only ones supporting the communities you guys are supporting, right? Right, right. Without asking questions. Like we don't know if our kids are documented. We don't know how they got here. We don't, we don't know unless the family tells us. Yep. Um, and what do you think's led, like if you could choose one to two, three things, I know it's more than that, but like what's led to your guys' success at Our Bridge with supporting the families you are? Um, well, besides the uniqueness, right? I mean, we're the only ones. Um, I think that we really care. You know, it's not just about the family. It's not just about our salary. It's not just about the picture and, and the accolades and, um, you know, the, 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 there's not a lot of, there's no ego behind it. And I think that what we were able to do is to find a team that really, really, really cares. Yep. Um, and they care of the entire family, not just the kids and their grades. Um, not just about what the school think of us, not just about um, proficiency and making sure the numbers match. And oh, well, yeah, they, but the numbers do match. Let me tell you that. <laughs> but I'm talking about like the grades and the proficiency. And, you know, um, it's, it's, we see the kids as kids and we see the families without judgment. Um, and I think that that's the most important part. I think that the people in the community and the leaders of the community and uh, people like you and Foundation Critical Alliance, I think that they see that. Mm -hmm. But for us, and for me, more importantly, I mean, for me, the, the, what I want is the families to see it. Yep. You know I mean? And everything else comes with it. Yep. And you've been in Charlotte. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kelsey. Oh, I just wanted to ask about, so Arbridge is housed in Aldersgate, the yes. senior community. Yes. Uh, has anything really special or unique? I mean, that is unique in itself. Um, but like, has anything special or unique come of that partnership? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, oh my gosh. I mean, Aldersgate is awesome. Um, we, when Greg, the first time that you came to our center, we were in Plaza Midwood. Yeah. We were in a, uh, at the what? Busting at the seams. Oh my gosh. Was, but you were making it work, right? I mean, like many. We had the best time. Hey, yeah. right next to the dumpster. That's right. Okay. Um, <laughs> you gotta make it work. Yeah. We, make it, we push the van, and you know, I mean, the kids learn how to change the battery. <laughs> That's experience. Hands on learning. experience. Yeah. Hands on experience. And they remember the kids are now in high school that were with us back then. I mean, they and they're so mad at us because they come to visit and they're like, "What? Oh yeah. We get pizza every Friday. We had pizza to graduate yeah. fifth grade." <laughs> Made them tougher. That was all made them tougher. They were like a third of a banana and a dino nugget. You know, it was just disgusting. <laughs> um, so now, yeah, so um, when we when we were, um, after we applied for the 501c3 and we started our bridge as our bridge, um, we stayed in Plaza Midwood for two years and we, our waiting list was growing um, and Plaza Midwood was really, really changing and gentrification was pushing our families farther and farther east. Um, by the last year, we were driving about 100 miles a day, taking the kids back and forth because how far they were from the center. Um, and we started looking I think it's important, right? Because like after school programs don't get buses. Like you're not a school. You, no. you, so like people need to understand a lot of, I think, efforts that programs and leaders like you are making to like physically run programs. And you're not just saying peace out. You're getting them on the... And the bus, right. and, and everything that comes with it, you know, the safety, the liability, making yeah. sure that there's no with the time, the stops. Right. Um, oh my gosh, yeah, it was it was tough. Um, but again, I mean, we made it happen for two years. So when we started looking for other places, the most important part for me was um, it has to be near the east side where the families are, and it cannot be a faith based place. Mm -hmm. um, Why? And, I think I, know, I mean probably because of what you said earlier, but just yeah. to answer that. No, I mean we we were we were offered um, places for from you know churches that are amazing. I mean there are churches that are amazing and groups yeah. of, of of faith um, neighbors that are one hundred percent supportive. But we didn't want to send a, a mixed message to our families. Yep, good. Um, so we wanted to keep it very very clean. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to do was we need to be able to do whatever we wanted with the building the same way we did with Plaza Midwood. So if you remember Greg, I mean, it was 
it was crazy. It was like yeah. each wall was a different color. It looked like your art in the back. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's my uh, sister law. If you want one, we can get you one. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Ooh, let me see. <laughs> oh, my God. It's a, oh, it's great. All the way? So pretty. I feel like I see something similar on your wall in the middle. My wall? That? Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. Um, this is how old I am. So those are CDs, <laughs> covers of CDs that I used to hear when I was young. <laughs> I was talking about your daughter's art, but I feel like oh, my she's, daughter's uh, art. she's on yeah. her way. <laughs> um, let me see if I, can, if I can show you more. Hold on. It's the hunt. You oh, see yeah. all the Legos and stuff on the floor? There you go. Yeah, this is her studio. I'm using her studio. But yeah, I mean, I still remember what you guys were, I mean, you use like the parking lot for a lot of your kind of, um, kind of larger events. So like you would walk inside your, the old spot and then use the parking lot and some other things for like the food and the events and the activities for the kids. We, uh, the, space. the yoga, the yoga people got super, super mad at us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because we were just, just blocking the parking lot. I'm sorry. Right. Um, and the owner loved us. It's like everybody in Plaza Mead were disliked. Do you remember this? Uh, this like um, um uh, his name was Cole. Uh, Cole Properties. Oh, I don't know. He had yeah, a bad black yeah. black yep. But he loved us, and he will let us do whatever we wanted. So we will come like um on a Saturday and just block the entire parking lot, and no one will pass. And <laughs> the yoga people that will come from this side and just cursing at us. I say, I want yoga people. You have to relax, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's defeating the purpose. Um. So um. Oh, that was great. That was awesome. Um, yeah, so we started looking for other places, uh, and we looked into like the rec centers, um, and it was going to be free right next to the Elder Skate Campus on, um, on Shamrock, you know, right. Methodist Home, I think it's called. And, um, but the thing is like, they couldn't really allow us to paint or hang things. It was just like, come with a box, leave with a box kind of after school. We couldn't do that. Right. And um, we were like starting to thinking about, do we need to build one? And Aldersgate was at the same time, they learned about us and uh, without me knowing, they were kind of looking into what we were doing and talking behind our backs with UNCC. Mm -hmm. And um, I would go to meetings and um, I would say my name and somebody will shout, oh yeah, we're gonna be talking about you tomorrow. And I'm like, am I supposed to be there? Need permission and, um, for that, right? <laughs> No, is it a good thing? Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, so they um, they will send people to visit the center and talk with our staff, you know, and, and um, they came forward and say, hey, we have this awesome building and it's empty and it's a dollar a year. Do you want it? Yes, we do. Right. Yes, that would be great. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so we moved there on um, June, no, sorry. Yeah, June 2017. So school ended on June 9th. Um, 17? No, the 11. Oh, 9, 10. Okay, whatever. So right. um, we moved Friday, the school ended in Plaza Midwood. And Monday, um, we moved. Oh, yeah, that week we moved, <clears throat> you know, seven years of crap that we had in Plaza Midwood. Yeah. And the next Monday, we started um, summer programs at Outer Skate. Hmm. Wow. Um, and that's a whole different podcast if you want me to tell you about that. But um, it, uh, it was fantastic. I love that building. It's exactly what I, I would have imagined, exactly what we needed. Um, and we're not only able to use the building and the space around it. I mean, Aldersgate is such an amazing host. Um, we can go and fish in their lake. We can walk through their nature trails. Um, their chefs has um, done you know, um, cooking demos with their kids. Um, we have brought our kids to sing there, and um, on Thursdays we had um, groups of kids that went to visit the grandmas and grandpas, um, mm -hmm. and they would just read for them, That's and awesome. that was awesome. Yeah, so it's a very, very special partnership, um, and I just love other skin. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, well, switching gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think in the past you've said that Charlotte isn't a welcoming city yet. Um, what do we need to do to change that? Government. Say more. Just wipe it clean or pass some new policy? Uh, um, it's a very, this is not our bridge talking, this is me. Sure. And what I know. Um, 
my family has mixed status. Um, I have a nephew that's in the Stuart Detention Center right now. And I don't know if you knew this, Greg. Um, no, I don't. So he was 18 in 2018, October 2018, when he decided to ride the, um, the train, the, the, what is it called? Light rail. Light, the light rail. Light rail. Light rail. Without a ticket. Mm. And he was stopped by the police. And because he um, is undocumented, um, he came with his mom when he was two from Argentina. Um, he didn't have an ID and he didn't have a driver license. Um, so the police took him in. And this was like two weeks before 287G um, was ended. Mm -hmm. You know, are you familiar with 287G? A little that? bit, but just tell everybody what, what that so is. 287G was a contract that the county uh, sheriff had with ICE. Yep. And basically what it meant is um, anyone who was um, anyone who was um, uh, um, um, anyone who was admitted into the jail uptown will have to go through ICE uh, process or immigration process. Mm -hmm. And regardless of the crime. You could be driving without driver license. You could be in a fight. You could rob a bank. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Wow. Um, if you were undocumented, you were um, sent directly into immigration procedures. And with Sheriff McFadden, uh, that he ended that. And I'm sure you have heard of the, the the mess that had happened afterwards. But um, I still think it was the right decision. But when they saw Gusti, they um, took him into custody. Um, and I used to call him and he was sent to the Stewart Detention Center the day after. Um, and he had like two credits to finish high school. Um, and he's been there since then. It's mm -hmm. been over a year and a half. Um, his mom has been like fighting and, and spending like $25,000 in, in lawyers. And his mom was in the, in the process of getting her situation um, um, cleared because she is married to a citizen. Um, but it took them so long to get all the paperwork and all the process through to start with Gusti that this happened right before she could start it. Yeah. Um, okay. And yeah, so I mean, to me, it's a very, very personal personal situation, what's going on in Charlotte. I think that there are two tales in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. I think there's a tale of the people and the neighbors that um, support our community and understand the struggle and understand that um, you know asylum seekers are not criminals yep. and that seeking asylum is actually a right. Yep. Uh, there are people that know that crossing the border is not a felony. It's not really a crime. It's, you know, it's, um, what's it called? Um, like a minor? Misdemeanor. It's a misdemeanor. Um, and there are people that understand that and people that value cultures and a lot of people that understand that no one here, unless you're a native, this is not your land either. Right. Um, so that's, that's one tale, which I think is the people that have helped and embraced our bridge and the people that you know, support us throughout all this entire time. Um, however, um, the policies in, in the mayor's office, especially, I mean, I've been very, very um, outspoken with it, that doesn't reflect how the city government sees us. Um, I think that there's a lot of credit being taken by the city government that shouldn't be there. Um, and one of the thing is, um, you know, they, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, Welcome in America conference that was going to happen here. Yeah, I think I saw some of the stuff you were posting. Right, so if that was, um, I love Welcome in America. I mean, they, I think that what they do, it's amazing. The, um, they try to reframe the narrative around refugees and immigrants. And um, I've been a big fan of their work. I just don't think that that should happen in Charlotte. Mm. Charlotte is not a welcoming city because when we needed the mayor to speak up for us, she didn't. And she still didn't. Um, with, with pressure, she wrote a letter that they read at an internal meeting saying, oh yeah, by the way, we support immigrants and refugees. Um, but she never signed a resolution. Um, she, when there were the um, ICE raids, right in our neighborhoods when our families were calling us from the closet saying that there's somebody at my door and I don't want to get out. My kids are crying. What do I do? Sure. Um, 
they didn't say anything when all the cities um, in the state uh, signed a letter together condemning this um, the ICE um, approaches to whatever it is that they do. Um, and our mayor was silent, silent. So I mean, I'm, I'm very, I, I, was t I was invited to be, and I was for a little bit in the committee to plan for the conference that mm -hmm. is coming or was coming to Charlotte, uh, but I jumped off. Well, because they were- Did you ever run for an elected office? What? Did you ever run for an elected position? No. Why? No. Um, no. I'm an outsider. <laughs> I like to keep people accountable. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we need both, right? We need all the above. No, politics is not for me. I think that um, I've been so burnt um, with a lot of people that I that I supported, and when things happen, they changed. And so I think politics um, ruined people. But if you're doing it, I mean, we're gonna keep you accountable. The need for government. Yeah, that's right. Good. I mean, I'm not saying this mental government. I'm just saying, you know, somebody needs to tell you you're you're not doing what you said you were going to do. Well, that's your right too, right? That's all of our rights. And right. And I think people need to get more involved in that and understanding that you know it's a. Uh, it's not right. Yep. Silence, it's loud, you know? I mean, and I keep saying that your silence, it's, it's, it's saying that you, that you support it. Yep. Unless you speak out, you're supporting it. Yep. That's at least how I see it. Okay, so we're gonna transition kind of to the end to respect your time. So a few kind of hopefully fun rapid fire questions. Um, so maybe related to politics or maybe not, but what's one actionable thing you think our audience should do to support our bridge or to support the future of after school programs? Um, okay, so support our bridge, 100% transparency here. Um, the event that we had last, that we had yesterday, uh, we fundraised um, a good amount of money to be online thing, um, right. but that was going to be our unrestricted gap covering yep. for this year. And, I don't think we need the advent in it. So any donations that could come to our bridge so we could yep. continue, you know, um, not just running the program, but actually existing. Sure. <laughs> we'll we'll add the link when we share this with everybody so they can yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, and for the future after school program, um, I'm a big fan of the National After School Association. They have been fighting to keep um, 21st century on the federal budget. Um, 21st century has been on the list of elimination almost every year. But I think that the the um, the, the um, danger, no, um, the risk is greater now. They do um, a good job with their messaging and with their kind of e petitions to local politicians and national politicians, which I appreciate. Right, right, and they are. We've been um, advocating with them. They invited us to go to DC with our kids to talk to uh, Burr and Burr and uh, Tillis and um, Adams. Um, they really do the work to yep. keep um, after school actually happening. So Good. that um, that's my nugget there for them. We, yeah, we can link them and shout them out too. Mm -hmm. um, okay, most important question as always, what does square pizza remind you of? My mother. Mo Why? <laughs> Where, what's the story? So in Argentina, you don't buy pizza. Like right. you're rich if you can buy a pizza. Okay. Who orders pizza, right? right? I mean, that, that never happened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so having like a round, we had to homemade pizza, right? And yeah. a lot, half of us are kind of Italian, so pizza, it's a thing. Sure. Um, but buying the round uh, thing to go in the oven, the rack, the thing. Yep. The rack, yeah. Pizza that's pan. A, that's a word. Yeah. That's pizza not a pizza word. Pan. Pizza pan. Pizza pan. Pizza pan. Okay, that, that was nowhere to be found. So we had the regular rectangular pans and my mother stretched that dough and we ate the pizza. So, I mean, it was fun. <laughs> so even at Square Pizza in Argentina? Oh yeah, and it was just called pizza. Lovely. What about pizza. school? Did they serve it in school? At school? Yeah. No, we didn't have lunch or breakfast at school. It was nothing. No, so in Argentina, oh, you're gonna find this interesting. So growing up, you could choose between going to school in the morning or the afternoon. So you can go to school like from okay, 8 to 12. 12. Like, no matter yeah, how old 12, you are. Wow. And then one to five. Um, and then when you got older, you had your PE classes like on the opposite side. So wow. I grew up going to school in the afternoon. I guess that's the genes of my kids waking up at 11, right? <laughs> Is that system still in place in Argentina? Yeah. Yeah, so we, we don't have a like that. Why don't we do that here? 
I think school stays are just too long. Just let the kids go climb a tree. Yeah. That's not work. Is that what you did in the morning? Uh, no, I cleaned. Okay. <laughs> did my mother, um, the, uh, you go get the, all oh, the other things you have to walk to go get everything. So I had to, this morning's was I go to the pen store, go to the bread store, go to the um, meat store, go to the mm -hmm. vegetable store. And you have to walk like 17 miles to go get a meal and then come back. So. That could be our bridges new tagline. So our bridges new tagline could be let the kids climb a tree. Let the kids climb a damn tree. <laughs> Put that on a t-shirt and be ready to go. Right. No homework. Climb the tree. Build a tree house. You know, I mean So Gonzo, thank you so much for joining the Square Pizza Podcast today and all the great work you're doing. Thank you so much. This was fun. Stay safe out there. Bye. Bye.